Please welcome Michael Adams. Great. Hey, Ian. <laughs> that was, you did well. Thank you, Thank you Ian. Uh, it's fun to be back here in Friday Harbor. And this is sort of an auspicious occasion. Yesterday was Earth Day, which is celebrated around the world. And this talk, I hope, will bring a little more of uh, Ansel's conservation world as well as his photography. I'm trying to mix the two together. And in the process, I want to talk about Ansel, his life, and our, my connection with it, uh, and trips that I took with him. And I think it'll be fun. And afterwards, we hope there'll be a uh, question and answer period. Apparently, I understand uh, there are Ansel Adams books and cards here. And for what it's worth, I'm happy to sign them. But uh, <laughs> I had nothing to do with them. Anyway, my wife, Jean, had a lot to do with uh, pulling the information for these talks. And what I want to share with you are a lot of pictures that wouldn't, are not, are not uh, in the exhibition here, but Ansel's well known for. Anyway, these are photographs, many of them from the national parks, many of them uh, in the 20s and 30s when Ansel was really very productive. Ansel is celebrated as probably the world's most well-known photographer today. Uh, I googled Ansel yesterday and there were 500,000, more than 500,000 hits. He's, there's a lot of interest in Ansel today in many, in many ways. And Ansel created images that respond to people, uh, that define our perceptions of nature and the unique, unique American ideal, characterized in our national parks and other areas protected for posterity. Ansel epitomized civility, the generosity of spirit. He was an original. Is that mine? He was an innovator. A, he was a, a teacher, conservationist, a mountaineer, writer of more than 30 books, his popularity, this is 1979, got him on the cover of Time magazine. And, oh, I had one more, but it didn't get into this one. Gary Trudeau had a cartoon of Ansel's work. <laughs> anyway, his art and perfection, uh, of, and his perfection of craft continue to inspire people uh, throughout the world. Ansel's place was evidence, self-evident. He started in San Francisco. He has a lot of photographs of the coast. He went to Yosemite. There are a tremendous number of photographs in the Yosemite and the Sierra Nevada. And the third area that he's fairly well known for is the Southwest. We'll show you some of these. But these, these are self-explanatory in, in where they are. And you'll see that many of these are national parks or national monuments. And we're up in your country, yeah. in the North Cascades. And even a, a dog got in. <laughs> and the East Coast, he didn't spend that much time on the East Coast, but he loved certain areas in Acadia National Park was a very special place. And Dorothy Kirpamonoli, who is part of this exhibit, has a number of photographs from this area. Hansel was born in San Francisco in 1902 of, from, of elderly parents. This is the house he grew up on. This is outside the Golden Gate. And you're looking across the, the Golden Gate to the Marin Headlands there. This image is from his house down toward the Presidio on the right. And the Golden Gate Bridge now crosses that uh, narrow area, and that's Baker Beach, where it was very easy to walk to from the house. When I was a little boy, uh, my grandfather used to walk me down there. Uh, during World War II, that was closed because it was part of the Presidio. But it was a place that was fun to go to. And uh, Ansel, I think, spent a lot of time there with, with his family. And it was just close to home. This is a photograph taken in 1918. He was 16 years old, just really beginning in 
photography, but this photograph is in the exhibit that's here. And we're looking at it with somebody who's very early in photo into photography, but he had an eye, no training at that time. But several of the ones you'll see at these early dates were images that are special. He had an eye for what he was doing, and they're kind of unique. Now, the Panama Pacific World's Fair in 1915, to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal, was a real eye-opener for Ansel. His father took him out of school and gave him a year's pass to the uh, exhibition. And he went almost every day using public transportation, but he was exposed to many, many things. Uh, the, the art of the day, the sculpture, the music of the day, the engineering uh, marvels, the different uh, venues from different countries and areas around the state. It was an eye-opener for him and probably made a huge, uh, had a huge effect on him at that time. That building still exists today and it's, it's a, kind of an interesting area. But as I mentioned, he was taken out of school. This was a drawing at age 12 of the Golden Gate. <laughs> he did very well, very poorly in school and was taken out and tutored. Uh, his father tutored him, but he, they hired people. He was tutored in Greek, Latin, and in uh, math. And uh, he, but he finally got a certificate graduating from uh, this lady's, I'm trying to think of her name, uh, it was Mrs. Kate Wilkins Grammar School in San Francisco, <laughs> thus ending his education with completion of the eighth grade. Subsequently, he got uh, several uh, honorary doctorates from Harvard, Yale, University of California, <laughs> San Francisco. And he, he, I think in one way he might have been a little embarrassed, but he was very proud of these honorary degrees. In, um, when he was 12 years old, he began to pick at the piano uh, on his own, and he was sort of self-taught. And when the parents realized that he had maybe some talent, they, they got teachers for him. And he went on for a number of years. Uh, at least two of the teachers he had got, got him to the point where they said, I can't teach you anymore, you need somebody else. And it began his career as he visioned of being a concert pianist. And that's what he was planning to do until he was about 30 years old. And we'll have a little more of that. This is uh, the house in San Francisco. And he continued to play over the years. But once he was into photography and gave up the piano as a real uh, idea of, of work, he continued to play for family and friends. And as arthritis got to the fingers, he was embarrassed when he couldn't hit the keys correctly. But we could get him a couple of vodkas and he'd usually play a little <laughs> bit. So he, he enjoyed the piano and the music uh, all his life. Now Yosemite was where he really came of age with a career and with an idea. In 1916, after being in bed with the flu, he read a, a book by, um, I got it here, In the Heart of the Sierras by James Hutching, who had, had published in 1886. And that got him interested in Yosemite and he convinced his father and mother that that's where they should vacation in 1916. He was there for about six weeks, and that was the first of his trips. He went to Yosemite every year the rest of his life. And in Yosemite, he was exposed to many, many uh, things in, in the material world that excited him. In, this is the family at the Cascades between Vernal and Nevada Falls. And this, this, he was given a camera when he went to Yosemite, a little box brownie that had 
tw a film with 12 images, 12, you could take 12. And he had it uh, printed by Mr. Pillsbury, who had a camera store and, and a photo finishing place in Yosemite. And when we, when we went to pick up the roll of film, Mr. Pillsbury came out and said, Ansel, you've got 12 pictures here. One of them is upside down on this roll. And how do you explain that? And he said, you know, I fell off a log, and I must have taken that picture. So if that's the case, he had a pretty good eye in upside down. This is another one of those taken, not on that first trip, but 1920 at age 18. That's a stunning image. And, you know, this is what he, he felt the, these images were something that uh, more than just the ordinary snapshot and more than just a record. He, he had an eye for what he wanted in these images. Now he met this fellow, Mr. Francis Holman, Uncle Frank, who was a retired mining engineer and an amateur ornithologist. And Uncle Frank took him on his first burrow trips, taught him camping in the back country, how to get along, how to, how to pack burrows. And on one of the trips, um, or prior to, uh, prior to that, he applied to the Sierra Club for a job as the custodian of the Lacan Memorial Lodge. And he got that job, which allowed him to come back to Yosemite. And for four summers, he was working here at this lodge. They had a tent behind it they could live in. But Uncle Frank got him to, uh, go with burrow, on burrow trips. And when Ansel had his photographic equipment, he needed something more than just his back, uh, the backpack. So he took, um, took a, or sent a letter to his father, um, a telegram, can buy burrow for 20, including outfit, can sell at the end of the season for 10, fine investment and useful, wire immediately as the offer is for today only. Anyway, <laughs> he got his burrow, and I don't know what he did in the winter with it, but he had a burrow for many years there that he would use because of all the camera equipment. And he taught me as a child how to pack burrows when we'd go out somewhere. And when Jeannie and I were married, we took burrows with us on pack, on pack trips. And when our kids came along, we took them on these trips. So it's, it's a marvelous animal, and it's great with kids. If they get tired, you just throw them up on top and say, hold on. <laughs> Ansel wrote uh, in 1972 in a preface to a new um, issue of jo Joseph Lacan's originally 1890 uh, book, as Summer of Travel in the High Sierra. But he wrote this. There is little difference between then and now in the miles and the time consumed on the trails. There is a set pace for man and for pack animal, shortened today perhaps by better trails and stream crossings. The sh slow speed of traveling with burrows gave a certain sharpened sense of awareness to all that we experienced, quite different from what we observe and know in, of nature from an automobile or an airplane. Many a time in the past 20 years, in an aircraft, I've looked down on the Sierra from 30,000 feet or more, all the intricate and beautiful canyons, meadows, lakes, and summits, which we knew so intimately and devotedly, and through which we wandered for weeks in the summers, seen thus seemed but a jumbled, inconsequential area of, of chaotic topography. So you look back and his awareness was probably stimulated by the slow travel that the, the burrow uh, forced you to. If you were hiking just with a backpack, you'd probably hike much faster. Now this image was one of his first that he was very proud of it. 1920, he uh, wrote to his father about this image. And uh, this image also is in the exhibit that you'll see here. The idea is as follows. In some way to interpret the power of falling water, the light and airy manner of the spray particles, and the glimmer of sunlit water. Very easy to think about, but not so simple to do. Can you see how 
Now, what I mean when I say the tone and texture of a print has much to do with character and condition. The reason for this lengthy explanation is that I want you to see what I'm trying to do in pictorial photography. Now again, 1918, his goal at that time was music. This is a representation of material things in the abstract or purely imaginative way. I feel happy over this picture, and to my mind, it is the best satisfactory composition I have yet made. In 1921, Ansel was introduced to Virginia Best, the daughter of Harry Best, the painter, who started that Best studio in 1902 in a tent. And they had a piano in their high school household in Yosemite. And Ansel was invited to play the piano and practice. And one thing led to another. <laughs> in 1921, uh, Ansel sent a letter to Virginia when he was up in Merced Lake in the backcountry. If only I had a piano along. The absurd absurdity of the idea does not prevent me from wishing, however. I certainly miss the keyboard. As soon as I am back in Yosemite, I shall make a beeline for your best studio and bother your good father with uproarious scales and Debussyan dissonances. <laughs> Two years later, he wrote to Virginia from San Francisco, I am now doing a little piano teaching. Most excellent for me as it will help my getting established, but it is a beginning and brings us closer to the happy day. I will continue my photography work as a means of incidental income until I find my music is filling my time. Thereafter, photography will become a hobby only. <laughs> I cannot let anything interfere with my mind, my, my music, which is my life's work. And in December of 1927, he wrote to Virginia, who was living in Yosemite, if I come up on the 26th and bring Ernst Bacon and two sleeping bags and a promise to eat at the cafeteria, can I sleep on your porch <laughs> or under your piano or down the chimney and play for you and walk with you to some dear old places? A week later, they were married. <laughs> In uh, January of 1928. Now, this particular series, the monolith, is half dome and it was the photograph that Ansel took that he probably later recognized was probably the change that led him to photography as a, a future. That it, he knew what he was doing, he knew how to get the photographs he wanted. And it's probably the, the point at which music was no longer his career. On this day in 1927, they climbed up to the diving board, the, that's where the arrow is. They climbed up the Lacan Gully, which is down off to the right, and then up on that ridge. This is in the gully, a lot of snow in April. And my mother at that time, before she, they were married, took a uh, 16 millimeter film of that trip. And this is a copy of much of that film the problem we're having tonight is we do not have audio. There's two and a half minutes of Ansel playing the piano. Uh, you can hear it. It's, it's coming from the computer, not from the other. What happened? Oh. Sorry. It'll start again. <clears throat> the audio, Ansel recorded this in 1945. And in our audience, we have Curtis Long, who took this 16 millimeter and first put it on tape.
tape. Don't remember what year. That's my mother. Ansel had glass plates with him, and on the next to last film, last glass plate, he took this image with a yellow filter. And this is where he realized he wasn't going to get what he wanted, but he knew what he wanted to do, and that was get a much darker sky. He changed to a red filter, made the corrections to the exposure, and this is the image today that everybody knows. Now, there's a lot of magic in the dark room in making these. And Ansel would readily admit that. He had said, you will never see this, but this is what I want you to see. And that was sort of his genius. And I'll show you again on other photographs what the difference meant in the work that he could do in the dark room to, to make something that he was happy with and satisfied. Now, in the 20s and 30s, Ansel went into the backcountry every year on various trips with the Sierra Club primarily. And as a result of that, he had a very large collection of photographs in Yosemite and in the Kings River Canyon, Sequoia National Park. In 1924 and 25, he spent four to six weeks each summer with the LeConte family. Joseph Lacan, and uh, again, Burroughs, look at that, wonderful animal. But it allowed him to take enough equipment with him uh, and enough, you know, the things that they can enjoy life to a certain extent. Um, and especially Ansel's photographic equipment. In 1936, Ansel was asked by the Sierra Club to take his many of his photographs of the Sierra, primarily in the Kings River Canyon, and this is Kings River Canyon, uh, back to Congress. And he saw over 40 senators at that time, and, and more, th more than that congressman over a couple, several weeks, presented them with what this part of the Sierra had to offer. And, this, there's, there was precedence in this because Carlton Watkins' photographs of Yosemite in the 1800s were shown and had an inter, there was an interest in Yosemite that helped protect Yosemite, which was a bill to protect Yosemite was signed by Lincoln in 1865. And again in Yellowstone, uh, William Henry Jackson's photographs of Yellowstone had a lot to do with Congress signing a uh, bill to protect Yellowstone as our first national park. In 1938, Ansel produced uh, a book, The Sierra Nevada, The John Muir Trail. This is one that was, came from that. This is currently outside of Yosemite, but it's in the Ansel Adams Wilderness. 
one of them, Ansel's favorite places. This book, oh, I have to tell you, in 2010, uh, the National Geographic came to my son and asked that I would go with him and a, ge a geographic photographer in the wilderness. I tried to find Ansel's tripod holes. That one, it's almost from the same place, but a very different part of the world. But these photographs in this book uh, were again many of them from the uh, Kings River Sierra. Oh, picked up here. And Ansel, when he finished the book, he sent a copy to Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, who took it to President Roosevelt, who refused to give it back, kept it for the White House, and Mr. Ickes had to ask for a second one, uh, which Ansel generously gave him. Uh, the book that was finished, uh, is the John Muir Trail, Sierra Nevada, the John Muir Trail, was underwritten by a fellow named Walter Starr, who was a Sierra Club director and who had lost his son climbing in that area, in one of the areas of, outside of Yosemite, uh, which was really great for Ansel. Here was somebody that was willing to support his work in this way. And uh, Walter Starr also completed his son's work on Starr's Guide to the John Muir Trail, which is still in print today. So it was, it was something that was Ansel felt very important, very concerned about, and wanted to make sure that this book and uh, the stories of the Sierra Nevada were passed on and how important this was. Anyway, 1940. President Roosevelt signed the bill making Kings Canyon a national park. So in the long run, it was a successful uh, adventure you know, by the Sierra Club in supporting this area as, as a national park. This photograph in uh, Frozen Lake and Cliffs was one Ansel felt very strong. It was one of his best photographs. But these again are, many of these are along the John Muir Trail. Again, Kearsarge Pass, uh, which is pretty high. And then you can see the donkey. The donkey was very valuable to take all that camera equipment. And they also use mules to get around. Now, I believe we have Ron Partridge's daughter with us tonight. So Ron Partridge uh, was a very good friend. He worked with Ansel and was sort of an assistant in a number of years, uh, around the 30s, in the 30s. The Southwest, I mentioned before, became very important to Ansel. In 1927, Albert Bender, who was an insurance man in San Francisco, but really Ansel's first patron, um, had a car, but he didn't know how to drive, and he wanted to go to the Southwest, and he asked Ansel to drive him. So they and, and one other lady drove to the Southwest, where Ansel met Mary Austin, a writer, and Witter Binner, a poet at the time, on that trip. Uh, and out of that meeting, Ansel and Mary Austin put together a book on Taos Pueblo. It was published in 1930, but they collaborated on this. A um, hundred books plus 10 authors copy or 15 authors copy were produced. I think it sold for $75, had leather binding. It was, it was beautifully done. Every page that had a photograph was sensitized. So the pages were actually produced in the dark room and then bound. It went out of print almost immediately. But a couple of years ago, a copy sold at Sotheby's for over $80,000. So this is a very valuable book if you can find one. Now this, is, this was kind of fun. Ansel's best friend. Companion of the trails, best man at his wedding, 
somebody he'd known pretty much all his life. Uh, they used to talk, and Ansel wrote him a letter in 1937. Dear Cedric, a strange thing happened to me today. I saw a big thundercloud move down over Half Dome, and it was so big and clear and brilliant that it made me see many things that were drifting around inside, things that related to those who are loved and those who are real friends. For the first time, I know what love is, what friends are, and what art should be. Love is the seeking of, for a way of life, the way that cannot be followed alone, the resonance of all spiritual and physical things. Children are not only of flesh and blood. Children may be ideas, thoughts, emotions. The person of the one who is loved is a form composed of myriad mirrors reflecting and illuminating these powers and thoughts and emotions that are within you, and flashing another kind of light, perhaps. No words or deeds may encompass it. Friendship is another form of love, more passive, perhaps, but full of the transmitting and acceptance of things like thunderclouds, grass, and the clean reality of granite. Art is both love and friendship and understanding, the desire to give. It is not charity, which is the giving of things. It is more than kindness, which is the giving of self. It is both the taking and giving of beauty, the turning out to the light, the inner folds of the awareness of the spirit. It is the recreation on another plane of the realities of the world, the tragic and wonderful realities of earth and men and of all the interrelations of these. Now, one of the people he met in the Southwest was George O'Keefe, became a very good friend. George O'Keefe's husband was Alfred Stieglitz, who in those days in the 20s and 30s was sort of the guru of photography, of the type of photography that Ansel was trying to be and trying to work with. And this particular pictures that I'm showing you of George O'Keefe, the group, she invited Ansel to join this group in the Southwest for 10 days of travel. Um, the fellow taking the picture is Godfrey Rockefeller, uh, George O'Keefe, uh, Orville Cox, who is the head wrangler at the Ghost Ranch where George O'Keefe lived, uh, David McAlpin and Ansel on the side there. And this is a 35 millimeter that Ansel took on that trip that's fairly well known of Orville Cox and George O'Keefe. But they had a wonderful trip in the Four Corners area of the Southwest. And uh, at the end of that trip, Ansel invited them to come to Yosemite the following year. He said, I'm gonna take you out in the back country of Yosemite. And they all did, they, they showed up. And in September of 1938, they, this is the group at the stables, and they look a little grim. <laughs> but they had a wonderful trip. And Ansel took them uh, to Tuolumne Meadows, the Vogelsang Pass area, and into the Lyle Fork of the Merced, and then they came out through Merced Lake. Some of you who are, know Yosemite know the trip. But they had a, they had a splendid time. And, Interestingly, George O'Keefe did not paint or sketch on that trip. This is one of their last nights in the Lyle Fork. I want you to notice the mountain in the back there. Uh, I'll, you'll see it again. But this was a spectacular place in Yosemite. It's at least two days from civilization, two days from a trailhead getting in either walking or on horses. Now, in 1941, this is before the war, Ansel had signed an agreement with the National Park Service to make, to produce murals for the National Park, or the Department of Interior building. He'd, Secretary Ickes had wanted this, and Ansel started out, and one of the trips that he did was the one I went in the fall of 1941. I was taken out of school, which was fine with me, and the three of us, plus all of that, got in that station wagon, and off we went. 
and we visited a number of parks, and it was really exciting for an eight-year-old to see these parks and travel. Uh, Zion, Bryce, there we are, that's me. Uh, we got stuck in uh, Butler Wash in Utah, which was also very exciting. The water was rising from thunderstorms upstream, but we, had, we got towed out before the total disaster. But all the, all the roads were like what you see back there, just, just dirt roads and ruts. But, but it was a tremendous experience for me in seeing, beginning to see these national parks. And this one I remember very well in Canyon Say because we climbed down from the rim on a hot day, waded the river over by this White House ruin, took the pictures, and then had to re-wade the river and climb out on a very hot day. But it, but it was a pretty exciting thing for a young person to do. Walpy, uh, he got permission from the head man of the uh, Pueblo to stay up there then overnight so he could take these early morning photographs. And then Ansel's most famous photograph is one he called Moonrise Hernandez, and that was taken on this trip. This is the photograph that Ansel took and modified in the darkroom the way he wanted it. Uh, we were driving back to Santa Fe that day and he saw this image he pulled over to the left side of the road, and it was one of these hurry, hurry, hurry. We got to get the tripod out. We got to get the camera on. I got to focus it, arrange it. He could not find his light meter, but he knew that the luminance of the moon was 250 foot candles, and from that he derived his exposure, which was okay. But this is what I want to show you. This is a straight print, no manipulation in the dark room. It's not very interesting. He saw this. This is what you would more likely see if, if we were looking at it. But what he did in the dark room is the magic of Ansel's work. And again, he said, You're not, this is not what you are going to see, but this is what I want you to see. And in producing these, he developed some symbols for his own use in printing these so he didn't have to go back and start absolutely from beginning. So he had certain things that he knew. But again, this is the straight print without any manipulation. Look at the clouds, look at the sky, look at the foreground of this cemetery. And it's something very special. He took this picture, put the slide back in, turned the film holder around, pulled the slide out, but the sun was gone from this foreground, so there's only one negative of this particular image. Well protected down at the Center for Creative Photography. <laughs> now, one of the things Ansel did, he was very proud of, in 1943, he was invited to come to Manzanar, which was a camp on the eastern side of, of the Sierra, where American citizens of Japanese descent were incarcerated. Manzanar. Ansel took several photographs on the four trips he made there that became sort of iconic. And this is one of them. And this is right down near Manzanar, taken on one of those trips. But Manzanar, I went with him on two trips. He did this on his own. He wanted to do something he said, and I'll, I'll read a quote here, but he wanted to do something to recognize this problem. Out of this, uh, these trips came an uh, exhibit and a book entitled Born Free and Equal. And he wrote, moved by the human story unfolding in the encirclement of desert and mountains and by the wish to identify my photography in some creative way with the tragic momentum of the times, I came to Manzanar with my cameras in the fall of 1943, I believe that the acrid splendor of the, splendor of the desert, ringed with towering mountains, has strengthened the spirit of the people of Manzanar. 
I am sure most have responded in one way or another to the resonances of their environment. From the harsh soil, they have extracted fine crops. They've developed these gardens among the barracks. And they've produced uh, vegetables in the farms that out of just raw desert that was kind of unique. It was a community, of to a totally self-contained community in a way. They had a hospital and they, they took care of each other. Now this was a relocation camp where they were supposed to be moved on if they wished, I guess, or if they could find a job. But it was, it was guarded. It had barbed wire, it had soldiers with guns, it had towers. So these were American citizens incarcerated. Now, in the book, Born Free and Equal, equal oh, no, I commented on that. Um, anyway, that's some of the, of the vegetables. This monument is just about the only thing that exists today. It's still there. It's a national historic monument uh, run by the National Park Service. Again, this was taken on one of those trips, one of Ansel's best known. Now, Ansel said he never went out to take a picture for a conservation or environmental movement. <clears throat> he wrote, he commented on his oral history for the Bancroft Library. He said, I was very young, 14, when I went to Yosemite. The idea of conservation had never entered my head. I knew about John Muir, and I remember reading about his death in 1914. To me, he was a naturalist and a writer, but conservation as such, developments in environmentalism and ecology was absolutely an unknown entity. When I got to Yosemite first, it was entirely without any awareness of the need for protection. I didn't know the difference between the national park and the national forest. And these things hit me, as they do any number of people, with a tremendous impact. And he's referring to going to Yosemite and seeing it for the first time. And I, he said, I hadn't been prepared. I guess I just responded to the natural qualities from the very beginning. That is, the details in the rocks and the presence of little things on the trail. My first ideas of conservation as such came when I met William Colby, who was the second president of the Sierra Club. And when he got into the Sierra Club and met people like Colby, you have to remember the Sierra Club started as a social group of elitists and intellectuals. They were trying to help John Muir keep the sheep out of Yosemite and the Sierra and preserved as a national park. Muir wanted the whole High Sierra included in the park. In 1908, you may have heard, John Muir stood, stood at Glacier Point and said to Bill Colby, Bill, won't it be wonderful when one million people can see what we are seeing today? Last year, Yosemite had about 4.2 million visitors. Ansel said, again, uh, that he never went out specifically to make a photograph for conservation or the environment. However, he was always happy to use his photographs in any manner that would support the conservation environmental movement. In 1940, I mentioned he was appointed by Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes. That program was terminated by World War II, but after the Second World War, Ansel began photographing in the national parks and monuments, and he received two Guggenheim fellowships to do just that. And that trip that I took in 1941, that was before the Guggenheims, but those photographs were sort of the, the beginning of the national parks and monuments uh, program that he was trying to do. In 1950, he produced a portfolio entitled The National Parks and Monuments. And he wrote in that, the national parks are indeed phenomena of an advanced society. James Bryce, once said that the concept of the national parks was America's unique contribu contribution to the democratic idea. In fact, it is difficult to conceive of America without them. 
Nevertheless, some confusion still exists within the public mind as to what national parks are, why they were established, and how they differ one from another. We are constantly seeking a satisfactory definition of the parks, which embraces the factual, administrative, and intangible objectives, such as a definition, such definition must be both positive and fluid, and yet never deviate from a clear, idealistic focus. We have been given the earth to live upon and enjoy. We hold the future in a delicate and pre precarious grasp, as one might draw a shimmering ephemera from the clutches of a web. The heritage of the earth, direct or synthetic, provides us with physical life. We have in part mastered its resources and believe we are able to extract therefrom what is required for millenniums to come without exhaustion of the source. Possessions, both material and spiritual, are appreciated most when we find ourselves in peril of losing them. The national forests were established just in time to prevent unimaginable disaster. Through far-seeing far efforts of men such as John Muir and Stephen Mather, the concept of the national parks was solidified, with vast areas being set aside in perpetuum against the ravages of diverse forms of exploitation. Then through the device of presidential proclamation authorized by the Antiquities Act, many national monuments of significant and exceptional worth were added to the growing system of conserved areas. The national parks represent those intangible values which cannot be turned directly to profit or materially advantage, material advantage, and acquires integrity, integrity of vision and purpose to consider such qualities on the same effective level as material resources. The dragons of demand have been kept at snarling distances by the St. George's of conservation, but the menace remains. Only education can enlighten our people. Education and its accompanying interpretation and the seeking of resonances of understanding in the contemplation of nature. Our time is short and the future terrifyingly long. Believing as we must that things of the heart and mind are most enduring, this is the opportunity to apply art as a potential instrument of revelation, expression, and perpetuation of wilderness actualities and moods. Through brush, pen, and lens, each one no less than another, we possess a swift and sure means of touching the conscience and the clearing of vision. The dawn wind in the High Sierra is not just a passage of cool air through forest conifers, but within the labyrinth of human consciousness becomes a stirring of some world magic of most delicate persuasion. The grand lift of the Tetons is more than a mechanistic fold and faulting of the Earth's crust. It becomes a primal gesture of the Earth beneath a greater sky. And on the ancient Acadian coast, a more ancient Atlantic surge, Atlantic surge disputes the granite headlands and more than the slow crumbling erosion of the sea. Here are forces familiar with the aeons of creation and with the aeons of the ending of the world. In 1943, Ansel wrote a personal credo uh, for American, the American Annual Photography. The function of a photograph may be of the simplistic practical nature, or it may relate to the most personal and abstract emotion. Uh, the sincerity of intention and the honesty of spirit of the photographer can make any expression, no matter how practical, valid and beautiful. What is required is an underlying ethic and a sensitivity to the importance and the true qualities of the world in which we live. No man has a right to dictate what other men should perceive, create, or produce, but all should be encouraged to reveal themselves, their perceptions and emotions, and to build confidence in the creative spirit. My approach to photography is based on my belief in the vigor and the values of the world of nature. 
in the aspects of grandeur and of the minutiae all about us. I believe in growing things and in the things which have grown and died magnificently. I believe in people and in the simple aspects of human life and the relation of man to nature. I believe man must be free both in spirit and society, that he must build strength unto himself, affirming the enormous beauty of the world and acquiring confidence to see and to express his vision. And I believe in photography as one means of expressing this affirmation and of achieving an ultimate happiness and faith. Hansel connected his work in the natural scene, the national parks and monuments, with his interest in environmentalism and in the wilderness. And many of these photographs have been used over the years just for that in the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, and, and other environmental organizations. I pause at this one. This has become one of Ansel's most famous images. But this is taken with a Hasselblad. It's a two and a quarter, two and a quarter. And it saw the first light of day in 1962 when Jeannie and I selected for our wedding announcement. So Jeannie and I have a, a love of this particular image. It was taken in 1960, but now it's one of the more popular photographs. In 1980, Ansel was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Jimmy Carter, and the citation to accompany that award reads, at one with the power of the American landscape and renowned for the patient skill and timeless beauty of his work, photographer Ansel Adams has been visionary in his efforts to preserve this country's wild and scenic areas both on film and on earth. Drawn to the bounty, to the beauty of nature's monuments, he is regarded by environmentalists as a monument himself and by photographers as a national institution. It is through his foresight and fortitude that so much of America has been saved for future Americans. In 19, Ansel died in 1984. And in 1985, Jonathan Spaulding wrote in his biography of Ansel. Uh, in August of 1985, a little over a year after An Adam's death, a crowd of several hundred people gathered near Soda Springs in Yosemite's Tuolumne Meadows. At the same spot in the summer of 1889, John Muir and Robert Underwood Johnson had camped under the stars and planned for the Meadows protection as a national park. Now, nearly a century later, this group has gathered to celebrate the official dedication of Mount Ansel Adams and the naming of Yosemite National Park as the United Nations World Heritage Site. Among the speakers that afternoon were several of Adams' old friends. Novelist and historian Wallace Stegner defined the link between John Muir and Ansel Adams. A place is not fully a place until he has had its poet. Yosemite and the Sierra Nevada have had two great poets, Muir and Adams. In consequence, I think these mountains are better understood, held worthier of respect and protection than they would be if those two had never looked on them and with reverence and been delighted with spring dogwood blossoms, exhilarated by glacier pavements, dazed by half-mile cliffs, and glorified by snow peaks blossoming like roses in the dawn. That's Mount Ansel Adams, 
And the ridge line that you see is the border between Yosemite National Park and Sierra National Forest, of which that particular part of Sierra National Forest is the Ansel Adams Wilderness. So it's sort of an ideal location. A year later, we took a pack trip in there with most of our family, and Ansel's ashes are up there on the ridge, which we think is quite appropriate. Anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I hope that we can have some questions.